From Kansas City, U.S. to Tallinn, Estonia, cities around the world are trying out fare-free transit service. Can this actually work? And if so, how? Stick around to hear about it on this week's episode of Straight Data Transportation Podcast. Welcome, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. I hope everyone's staying healthy and staying sane during this time with the virus. Uh, we just got to persevere. Uh, before I get started into today's topic, I want to say if you're listening to this on the Straight Data content main channel and you just want to hear transportation related uh, podcasts, then subscribe to my transportation, my Straight Data Transportation channel. And if you're listening to this on my straight data transportation channel, and you want to hear all my other topics like business and sports, etc., please subscribe to my straight data content channel. And I'll put the links in the description and the cards as well. So give this, uh, give this video a like, go ahead and subscribe. That really helps me out and helps me connect with you guys. So with that, I'll get into the topic for the day. You know, it was 2013 when Tallinn, Estonia became the first capital city in the world to make transit fare free for all resident users. Since then, there's been some cities around the US and around the world. And now it's estimated, there's a New York Times article that estimates about 100 cities around the world that have tried or partially implemented or fully implemented fare free transit, meaning you don't have to pay any fare to board on any of their uh, transit vehicles or transit modes. And Kansas City is sort of the big city in the U.S. That's the latest one in global news to try this out. Uh, although there are some European cities that are also investigating. And there's, there's lots of cities in the U.S. that are now thinking about it too. But Kansas City really made headlines late last year, 2019, as far as deciding to go fare free. Um, so the question is, is this model becoming a trend? I mean, it seems like it is. And if so, you know, what are the implications? I mean, could, could this model for public transit spread to all sorts of cities? Could, could New York, you know, could, could all the small towns, all the small cities, could all the huge metro areas, the, the super huge transit agencies all get on board with this? Or is this something that's sort of a niche that's only for a certain type of agency that only has certain pros and cons? We'll talk about all that. Um, but first, I just want to go over Kansas City's kind of their, their vitals. You know, they were bringing in about 8 to $9 million in fare revenue before the council, the city council decided to go ahead and subsidize the extra cost that would make this service fare free. So that is what they're going to forego by relinquishing uh, use to everybody without charging fare. Now, Kansas City had just built a light rail line that was nationally recognized. You know, um, it's not every day that there's a new light rail service in the U.S. So um, I don't actually I don't know exactly if it's coded as light rail in in NTD. I think it is. But nevertheless, it was a. It was either a, a rail, uh, a light rail, or a streetcar type service, and that service they made free to anyone who used it. So you know that's another thing in this conversation. A lot of agencies, when they're trying out fare free service, they allow it for a portion of their service or a certain mode. They might have rail and bus, and so they let bus service free. They might let local bus service free but charge for express buses and, and premium transit like rail or vice versa. In this case, Kansas City was allowing boarding onto their rail system for free. And they had other programs like students rode for free, seniors rode at discount or for free, which plenty of cities have those programs. And I just want to also review for Kansas City, you know, the coronavirus may have thrown a a wrench in their plans here to go fare free because they hadn't actually started this. Their fiscal year starts in May. It starts May 1st, actually. And so it makes it a pretty timely topic. You know, I don't know their plans. I haven't stayed up to date with the exact plan. I don't even know, you know, some agencies, most agencies I think are still open. They're still operating. 
during this shutdown time, which is sort of weird, but I've talked about this previously. Transit agencies, they're reluctant to shut down. There's lots of worker unions involved and low-income people that need to need to use a service. So it becomes a really politically challenging thing to do to shut down a transit service. But that begs the question, are they still on track to start May 1st with their fiscal year, this new program? They decided for the next coming, the upcoming fiscal year that they were going to enact these measures to allow fair free operation. So are they on track for that? Is that gonna happen coming up here in a couple days? Um, I might drop this video on the 30th of April. So is that gonna happen on May 1st? What are the implications gonna be? How's it gonna work? You know, are, are people ready? Obviously not many people are gonna be using the service right now, but uh, that will be super interesting to watch. And you know, Olympia Washington had a pilot program where they had 60,000 additional riders because they went fair free for some period um, when they were testing it out recently. Indian River County in Florida has been fair. That's a smaller service has been fair free for, I think, over a decade now. I mean, it's been a long time. I don't know exactly when they started that. But it's been known in Florida as a smaller agency that's been fair free. And of course, Indian River County is not a low income county. It's one of the highest income counties in Florida. So um, there's an underlying funding discussion to be had when talking about this. St. Lucie County, though, which is which is lower income than Indian River, joined the party in 2017, uh, late 2017. They went fair free as a two year pilot that. I think they've continued and they're planning on continuing and they saw significant increase in ridership as well when they switched from fair to fair free. And that was on all six or seven bus routes. Once again, it's a small agency, but there's cities around Europe, Luxembourg. Now Luxembourg, I think just did this. They just enact, enacted this um, in 2020 earlier in the year. Luxembourg, I think has a population of 600,000 people. It's not a huge city, but I think its its main city is known for traffic congestion and lots of people use cars. And it's got a high per capita income as well. I think one of the highest in the world. But they decided in order to get people to stop using cars, to s stop the congestion, let's let transit be free for everybody. And they did see, I think they've seen some success. I don't, I thought that they started that this year in 2020. Um, someone can correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. And I don't know what all the success has been. And there's been other programs and other cities have been in, uh, in Europe have been checking into it. I think Rome did a program where if you brought trash to recycle, you know, because they wanted to, it was sort of like a full cycle ecological or e environmental program where, you know, they want to increase recycling. They want to get rid of litter and trash in their city, supposedly. And if you brought trash to recycle, you could receive transit tickets. So it was basically free transit tickets. Uh, you didn't have to pay, but you had to pick up trash or throw your trash enough trash away uh, for them to give you a free ticket. I heard something about that. I don't know how that went, but there's been all sorts of programs. Um, I, I do think there is a movement. I think that in the last five years, there has been a movement to try to understand if allowing fare free service in some scenarios will work or if it just doesn't work. I think conventional wisdom has said that if a transit agency operates for free, then the people who use it and the public will view it as a cheap service. It sort of has the value that you charge for it, in other words. Um, that's why Walmart is seen as a lesser brand than, you know, some fashion retailer, um, like Macy's versus Walmart. You go to Walmart to get really poor quality stuff because it's really cheap. And you go to Macy's to get really good quality stuff because it's expensive. So applying the same logic, people just typically, if a service is free, they tend to view it as lower quality. And therefore there's a negative public opinion. I think that's the traditional logic and the traditional thinking around fare free service. And there has been research, uh, Joel Valinsky from Center for Urban Transportation Research did, I think, a paper in 2002 about, um, about some negative sides of, of fare free service. 
unruly passengers, crowded buses, cost issues, and I'll get to some of that. But I think the chain, there's a change in the thinking where it doesn't have to be a poor quality service just because it's free. And there's some, there's some differences in thinking, and it's not a one-size-fits-all approach when it comes to this topic. Some agencies might see different results than others when they discuss fare free. And that's why you're seeing a lot of agencies really probing at it, trying to figure it out, testing it out. I don't think we've gotten to the point where it's taken over, but it's an, it's a very interesting concept. Now, the way I think about it personally is you, you have to go back to the goal of your agency. You have to go back to the goal of having public transit in the first place. I mean, obviously if your goal is to be profitable, then every agency in the United States would be failing because no agency, no public transit agency that reports to the NTD or APTA for that matter is a profitable agency. They all run at deficits. They all run with subsidies, public subsidies. Now that makes sense. They're a public transit agency. They take money from the private economy and that they divert it to a resource and now the goals of that resource is the question at hand is the goal of your resource to reduce traffic congestion to pull cars off the road environmental benefit is it for low-income people to provi provide a social safety net so that people without cars can still participate in society you have to really triangulate all those different types of goals together and figure out what are your priorities as, as an agency because that will dictate your likelihood of taking this extra step of being fare free. And you also have to look at means, the means of your agency. What is the maximum possible funding that you can acquire bar fares? And how are you operating right now when it comes to fare box recovery ratio? Are you making a lot of revenue and fair collection or are you making virtually no revenue and fair collection but you're still operating and so these two main points are going to drive the discussion what are your goals as an agency and what are your means as an agency when it comes to goals i mean if your goal is just to to get cars off the road and you want to do you want to get the maximum cars off the road for for the dollars that you spend then you might have a different answer than if your goal is to ensure that people at poverty or under poverty have complete, you know, have good access. If your goal is to increase economic activity, your answer might be different than if your goal is to reduce pollution. All these goals are going to are going to form and shape your priorities as a as an agency and that's basically down to what your public desires and what your public wants what your public sees as valuable. Some cities that are considering, you know, since Kansas City has made their, made their, gone out on a limb, there's some agencies that either have been or are, are now considering fare-free transit service. Some big ones like Salt Lake City, Los Angeles, Denver, Boston has had a lot of back and forth, Boston MBTA. Um, and I think all of those cities actually have a rail component to their system, which Kansas City does. Interestingly, the other two agencies I mentioned, those are small bus providers, small bus systems, like a few routes, less than 10 routes um, or around 10 routes. But Denver, L.A., Salt Lake City, they all have light rail, you know, heavy rail components. They draw much higher ridership numbers and they have much higher operating budgets. Nevertheless, they've all had po either political pressure or public pressure to at least investigate the fare free concept. Now, do I think that an agency like Los Angeles Metro is going to be able to pull off a fare free implementation? Absolutely not. I mean, I don't think that that will ever happen. Um, I do think that there's a threshold at which once you are at a certain size, and especially, you know, once you're collecting a certain amount of revenue off of that, um, there's not a lot you can do with uh, what you've got. And there's not a lot that you can, I mean, you can't come up with hundreds of millions of extra dollars. You might be able to come up with 1 million extra dollars or 2 million extra dollars, or in Kansas City's case, 8 or 9 million extra dollars. That's a lot of money. But to come up with 
hundreds of millions would be a huge step. Now, Los Angeles comes up with hundreds of millions of dollars seemingly all the time on capital expenditures, expanding their networks and, and whatnot. But there's a huge hurdle when it comes to um, implementing that sort of system. Uh, and here I'll go into the pros and cons of, you know, when you're looking at what are we going to gain from going fair free and what are we going to, what's it going to cost us? You know, there's more than just one gain. You know, you might think the gain is, okay, well, you have more ridership and the loss is, well, it's going to cost more. But it's it, it's it goes beyond that. So when you think of, first of all, when you think of productivity as a transit agency, typically the measure that you use is not just ridership or should not just be ridership. You know, lots of commentators and bloggers look at transit ridership, which is just the number of boardings, uh, transit vehicle boardings. They count how many times a person boards a bus or boards a vehicle. And their discussion is always driven by ridership. And I always go one step further because it doesn't make sense to just count ridership if there's some other factor, like if service got cut in half, but ridership got cut in half. Okay, well, there's an explanation behind why the ridership fell. If you just make it about ridership, that's a horrible thing. But let's say ridership stayed the same and service got cut in half. Whoa, that's that's incredible. That means you just got rid of half the cost, but you still are carrying the same number of people and delivering the same amount of mobility. Well, that's a huge improvement. But if you're just looking at ridership, that's going to look like a net no change. You're just going to look like a it's not even, there's not even going to be a blip in the radar. So ridership productivity is really determined by the amount of money spent to deliver one passenger boarding or passenger mile or, you know, any other form of metric to determine mobility. How many people are we moving? How much mobility are we creating for how much we're spending? And if you subtract the fare revenue, which is how much the passengers are valuing that service and are willing to pay for the service, then you can also boil it down to, to subsidy spent per passenger boarding or subsidy spent per passenger mile. So mobility um, as a function of the subsidy to the system or the subsidy to the public. Uh, so those are two different ways of looking at productivity. You can get increased productivity, you can get increased ridership per subsidy or increased or decreased subsidy per boarding when you go fare free. So that would be a pro. You're delivering more mobility for a lower cost. Uh, you can also get increased economic activity. If more people are riding the bus and using it to go do things that they otherwise wouldn't have done because that barrier was, I don't, I don't want to have to drive there, I don't want to have to pay to park. And I definitely don't want to get on the bus and go downtown because I, what am I going to do? Pull $2.50 out of my pocket? No. But if the bus is free and it's going by your house and you don't have to pull two fifty out of your pocket, you might as well just go and, and there's a ton of other people using it. The stigma might go away a little bit and you might just say, oh, I'll hop on the bus, go down to the town and, and, and party. So you might get some more economic activity that you wouldn't have had because of the barriers before. And especially if the stigma is removed on riding the bus, then what you get is you get tons more people that have money in their pockets that are choice riders that are going to use the system and do whatever they do. And it might increase tax revenue, sales tax receipts, whatever it is. It, it might increase sales within your city core and, and benefit people through employment, etc. Also, you could study improvement to access and public goods like the VA, libraries, parks, hospitals, if people are able to go to the doctor more often, if veterans are able to go to the VA more often, that might be a really positive public good. And if you take away a barrier like having to ride a bus for, you know, that's that's going to cost them $5 round trip, some older people don't have $5 laying around. I mean, they live paycheck, I, I guess $5 is kind of easy to scrounge up, but let's say they have a weekly doctor visit. It's going to be really tough. I mean, you're taking $5 a week out of some old lady's pocket that lives paycheck to paycheck. You know, she's on a fixed income uh, or some veteran. It's hard for them to get around anyway. There's plenty of excuses. And if you take away that fare, it's one less obstacle to their 
access to some other public good that you're already paying for to provide to them. Um, so if you can connect the link, you can really make the system more efficient. And that's one way to measure the, the pro of fare free transit. Also improvement in the image of your city, which can lead to population growth. I think this has actually been studied in some European cities um, in Tallinn, Estonia, for instance, you know, where they really, I started out talking about them. They noticed that their population grew a ton more after they implemented this fare free service than it was growing before. And it's because they made this service available to all residents. So you had to be a resident of the city. So there were probably lots of people who lived out just outside the city or kind of on the exurb that moved in because they wanted to be part of the system instead of having to pay for transportation to, to go from outside of the city to in the city every day, they had to move inside the city, become a resident, and then they got access to this. Um, they got access to this good, but from the city's perspective, now they have a lot more population growth. I mean, let's say you're Kansas city. I mean, you might attract people from all over the country because this is one more notch in your belt. I mean, you can brag this as a city, and really flaunt this as a public good that's gonna attract young people, young professionals. Oh, there's a free bus service, free rail service in their city. I can get around a lot easier. I mean, this is just one extra thing, one extra factor that might attract people to your city. And if you attract people to your city and your population grows, that increases economic activity, but it also increases the tax base. So if you make up for the cost in an increased tax base, you know, that count that as a pro. And also you have to, you have to take into account the elimination of the cost of collecting a fare. I mean, fare collection systems are pretty ex expensive. In buses, they, they're usually at the front. They have, you know, it's a complicated piece of uh, computer and, and machinery at this point. You know, it's electronic. You, you put the bill in. It might you have to accept tickets or all sorts of uh, things. And it's got to be a lockbox where all the cash goes into. Obviously, there's no... There's no change given, but all that cash goes into a lockbox. It has to be, you know, indestructible basically. And people have to open that box and collect all the cash out of it and all the coins and process the cash and coins, count it all and budget it all. And there's enforcement. There's people that jump over uh, the barriers when it comes to subways and people who evade fares. You don't have to worry about all that law enforcement um, when it comes to fare evasion and, and enforcement of the fare collection process and just the documentation of the fare collection process. Even when it comes to not just cash, but when people load cash, uh, when people load money onto a card and use a fare card, there's a lot of technology that's, that's goes, that goes into that. So those, those are all positives. Those are all pluses or pros to eliminating fare for transit. And if you just think about the barrier, the real big thing is the, is the barrier. Now there's a cost barrier. I mean, if someone just simply cannot afford it or does not want to afford um, to pay that 250 or 150, $2 each way, however much it costs. Now think about if they've got to take a transfer to get to where they're going, you know, at the end of the day, they might just say, I'm going to pay $2 here, $2 there, and then another $4 on the way back home you know, I don't want to make this trip. And so that's a mobility that they're not able to have. Now we're assuming they don't have a car, they don't have another means. So they're just not going to be able to access that thing that they wanted to go do that. Now, if you make it fare free, they have the availability. It might take them still take them long time to get there through the bus, uh, lo longer than if they had a car, but at least they have access to that, you know? And so you enter in the time, the, the cost, the money value of time and, now you add in the fare cost. You take away the fare cost portion. But for a lot of choice riders, the fare cost it, to, as a barrier of entry is more of a psychological barrier than it is a monetary barrier. I mean, there's plenty of users that have enough money to ride the bus, but they don't want to go into their wallet. They don't want to have cash on them. They don't want to have to load money onto a card. I mean, that's all just a lot of extra steps and then they have to put their cash into the box every time they get on a bus. It just makes the whole bus experience less attractive in not so much of an objective sense, but sort of a psychological sense. If I could just walk onto the bus, I mean, no one's even gonna check. I mean, I don't have to put any money anywhere. I don't have to load, I don't have to worry. I don't go online, load up my card or tap it or whatever. Just walk on, just walk on, it's that simple. You wait, it pulls up, you walk on, it, it pulls away. 
You can walk on the back, the, the front. You don't need to check or anything. So that is the barrier that you're eliminating that's allowing for the extra ridership. Of course, there's tons of people that now are going to be able to ride because they weren't able to afford it before, but there's also plenty of people that will ride it just because it was a hassle to pay. It was more of a hassle than it was an actual cost barrier. And so you're going to gain choice riders and non-choice riders. Now, let's move to the cons. I mean, what are the extra costs to going fare-free? Well, obviously, you're going to have um, unruly passengers. You're going to have people that go on the bus. It's It didn't cost them. You know, they might try to sleep on the bus. You know, I live in Florida where it's super hot. So if I was homeless and I wanted a break from the heat and wanted to get on an air-conditioned bus, you know, this would be an op this would be an opportunity. Now, do you want a homeless guy sitting on a bus all day just to get the AC and take up a seat from someone else who may choose not to ride it because they don't want to sit next to a homeless guy all day That's that's been on the bus all day? I don't know. So this might cause an increase in law enforcement costs and, um, and the bus driver also might not be so pleased about this. They might have to call the cops more often and deal with unruly passengers and have to kick them off. So the drivers are not going to be happy necessarily. Also, you're going to have higher ridership, which the drivers don't like either. I mean, if a bus driver could get away with nobody riding the bus and he still gets paid to just drive along, he's going to prefer that to having to stop and look for passengers and, and get the bus to a stop, you know, get it back up to speed. You know, that's, that's all a hassle. Open the door, close the door, make sure the guy pays make sure everyone's being, you know, well behaved on the bus, following all the rules and probably getting all sorts of verbal attacks from time to time. I mean, if a bus driver could have the choice between less ridership or more ridership, getting paid the same amount, the bus driver's probably going to choose the less ridership personally from their standpoint. Um because it's in their interest to not have to do as much, to not have to stop as much, to not have to um deal with passengers as much. So this is going to increase the, the strain on the bus drivers to where you might have to pay them more. They might have, you might have higher turnover. Bus drivers that you know, have been working for a long time that all of a sudden you switch fare free, they say, I'm out of here. And so you might have to, to fork up a little bit higher, uh, higher pay to the bus drivers. And because you're going to have so many more riders, you might have to add service. You might have to add a couple buses in the route. Um, increase the frequency, increase the service, uh, hire more drivers. So there's going to be additional service costs unless you've got tons of latent capacity that pe that no one's using. And despite the increase in ridership, your current system is able to hold them and able to carry those passengers. But if your buses fill up because there's so many new people, you need to actually add extra buses. It's going to be an additional cost. That's a con. Also wear and tear on the bus interior, lots of passengers and lots of um, and also cleaning, you know, lots of passengers means lots of trash and spills and weird stuff, you know, people leaning their head against the, the window and getting it all greasy and people fooling around and breaking parts, you know, seat cushions, et cetera, et cetera, on the bus. It's going to increase your cost of upkeep and maintenance and cleaning. Also, there might be an increase in passenger safety incidents. So you have tons of new passengers, a lot of new passengers uh, interacting with the bus in a system and in an infrastructure that may not be used to it, may not be uh, caught up. You might have tons of bicyclists now using, trying to use the rack, getting off, getting on, crossing the street, and there might be safety incidents with the bus and passengers and other cars not expecting so many passengers. Um, you might have more crashes and injuries. And I already brought up capacity issues with full buses. You might also have slower travel speed, which will make the bus less competitive with a car that's able to go normal flow, free flow speed. Because if the bus is starting and stopping, now I know you're not collecting fares. So to a certain extent, if there's only a few new riders, your bus should actually go faster because now your dwell time is less per, per stop. You might stop to pick up an extra passenger here or there, but they get to just walk on. You don't have to wait for them to put their fare in before you can start moving again as a bus driver. But if there's so many new riders that even though they're not having to pay fares, you have to stop a lot more frequently, then your bus might slow down because you have to start and stop so much. And when the service slows down, 
then the service becomes less competitive and there's a lower likelihood that people will want to use it. So it's a, it's a competing factor right there. Um, so those are all the pros and cons that I could think of. Please comment down below if you can think of any more um, pros and cons when it comes to fare free transit. I went over the cost barrier and the psychological barrier especially, and that is where a lot of the benefit comes from. Some of these agencies say, well, you know what? I know we're going to have to fork up a million more dollars a year, but we'll find that in the budget so that we could get all these extra positives, increased population, increased uh, public opinion, image, um, increased economic activity, increased ridership. We want to provide mobility to the people that can't access it through other modes. And we're willing to pay the extra million dollars to gain so much more mobility. I mean, we're already paying so much for what we're getting now. And if we pay just a little bit more, we can double what we're getting now as far as mobility provided. And I, I wrote down an example. I mean, you have a $10 million operating cost and you have a $1.5 million revenue from fares. And so that's your fare box recovery ratio, uh, 15%, which is the amount of fare revenue you gain as a share of your total cost. Most agencies in the U.S., the fare box recovery ratio is less than 30%, less than 25% even. There's only a couple agencies, really, a few agencies that have a fare box recovery ratio over 50%. So every agency in the U.S. is running at a deficit, um, running with some subsidy. But the fare box recovery ratio is what the users of the system, what they pay that makes up. So let's say you're running at 15% fare box recovery. You're collecting $1.5 million. Your total cost is $10 million. So as a society, as a public, as a group, you've agreed to pay an $8.5 million subsidy per year. And let's say you get 10 million riders per year, 10 million boardings. So you're paying 85 cents per boarding. And, you know, this, these are made up numbers. I don't think that really makes a lot of sense, but let's just say that's the world you're living in. So 85 cents per rider is your subsidy and you're paying a dollar and 18 cents. I'm sorry, you're getting 1.18 riders per dollar spent. So let's say we switch to a no fare system. Then let's say let, we'll double your ridership. And this has happened before. I mean, with St. Lucie County Transit, when they went fare free a couple of years ago, in the one year following their move to fare free, their ridership almost tripled. So doubling your ridership is not that far fetched, you know, depending on the circumstances and what kind of people you have in your uh, system, in your, in your area, and what the demand is going to be. Let's say you go from 10 million boardings to 20 million boardings. And you have to increase service some, so you go from $10 million operating cost to $15 million operating cost. You add a, f you know, a few buses, you don't double your service, but you, know, you multiply it by, uh, or you increase it by 50% and, and other costs included in that. So you drop down to $0 from fare collection, so now your subsidy is $15 million. And if you're running this example out on paper, if you're running this example out on paper, you'll see that now you have $15 million in subsidy, but you have 20 million riders. And so now your new cost, uh, as far as subsidy per rider is 75 cents and you're getting 1.33 riders per dollar spent. So, you know, from the public side. So this is, uh, this is an example of how you can benefit as an agency. You know, and then imagine all your riders that now they don't have to pay a fare. Now they're not paying uh, $5 each time they want to ride the bus or $4 each time they want to ride the bus. What are they going to do with that $4? I mean, that $4 is going to go somewhere for the people that had already been riding it. And now they get to ride it for free. That money's not going to evaporate into the ether. They're going to spend that money on food, on on consumer items, whatever they want, but it's going to go back into the economy and it might allow people who are at the lowest level, who, who have low incomes um, and they need to get around to certain things, their job. So they, they're going to pay for transportation one way or another. So if you make this sub, uh, if you make this subsidy right here, it's going to free up a lot of space in their budget. They're not going to do anything else with the money besides spend it through the economy. And that's the type of Keynesian and 
that's the type of Keynesian thinking that can really get you your money back in this sort of transaction. Now, I do have to wrap up pretty soon, and I, I will say, you know, I ran through the example and I just talked about the benefit, but obviously, if you've listened to my business podcast, you understand that I'm an Austrian economics guy. And personally, you know, I don't agree with making public transit fare free. I mean, I don't even agree with there being public transit at all. Uh, if it were up to me, the roads wouldn't be owned by the government. And, and I know that's an extreme thought. And, and when you listen to my transportation podcast, you might burn me at the stake for saying that because our whole system, our whole society is built off of public roads and public infrastructure. But, you know, I, I think that if the pub, if the government and the state governments, the the especially the state and federal governments, if they weren't controlling the transportation systems, I think that we would be a lot more advanced. I think that transportation would be very cheap. I do have to give credit in the United States. We've made transportation costs very cheap, but, you know, as a share of the household budget, but a lot of it comes at the price of a subsidy and subsidies always hold technology back. We have subsidized car travel for a long time, and now we're subsidizing transit. But these might not be the most efficient ways to get around. I always say that if the government was not involved in subsidizing transportation and providing transportation through roadway construction and, and funding the roads, we might be flying by now. I mean, if you're worried about the small man not having access to travel because roads were private, then some other entrepreneur would allow all the small guys in the world to get around by just flying around. Because if the roadways were owned privately and there was a monopoly or something like that, you know, the pressure is going to build up for people to want to travel and some innovative mind is going to come along and make it available for those people. So I always joke with people, if the government hadn't been involved in transportation, we might all be flying around now instead of driving around. But that aside, I guess a lot of the times when I talk about transit, I'm operating in the current world and I'm looking at the data as it stands. And given our current circumstance, our current situation, I'm commenting on the pros, the cons, obviously, within the system we have. In other words, if we have decided that the public is going to take care of the transportation, we might, I might as well study it such that we operate it in the most efficient way possible. And so when it comes to public transit, the example, the pros, the cons I give, um, obviously, I believe that private ownership of roads were prevalent, the system would be a lot better. There's a lot of inefficiency, a lot of waste in the public ownership and public transit. But, and I believe that buses and railways could be operated privately. But given the way we have it now, if a system wants to make decisions, like I said, we go back to the goals of the system, the means of the system, and we look at these pros and cons, and we go through an example like what we just went through. Do you come out on top? Do you come out with more riders per subsidy dollar? Then that might be a benefit for you. And you might get some more economic activity. You might have some other pros that you can chalk up. And you also you have to look at all the positives and all the negatives. The one thing I will say, the one disclaimer I will make is pretty much everyone agrees, everyone who studies this topic is in agreement that large systems with, with very high fare box recovery ratios this is not a good idea. Fare-free transit is not a good idea for them. Might not be a good idea when you're dealing with hundreds of millions of dollars in operating expenses and you're already operating at a greater than 50% fare box recovery ratio. What that means is you've got hundreds of millions of dollars to make up if you were to decide to go fare-free. Where is that going to come from? It would just not be feasible. For example, San Francisco Bay Area Rapid Transit, BART, they, they boast the highest fare box recovery ratio in the country. Very high income area with very progressive mentality, tons of environmental enthusiasm, 70% fare box recovery ratio. The users of the system pay for 70%, 65 to 70, I mean, depending on how you look at the numbers, 65 to 70% of the system cost is paid by the people who use it. Hey, that's pretty good compared to the rest of the country. And their operating expense budget is $777 million. 
So if they were to decide to go fare free, they'd have to come up with 70% of $777 million. So you're talking over $500 million. And yeah, all those people who use your system are going to get a lot of money back in their pockets, but you're talking about people that tend to be higher income. Same thing with New York Metro. I mean, people float the New York Metro idea and it's not even close. I mean, it's we're talking and now we're talking billions, okay? New York Metro 55% fare box recovery ratio, $9 billion operating budget. So you're going to have to come up with 4 or 5 billion dollars. That's not going to happen. So we tend to think that large mega agencies where densities are high, populations are willing to spend and support the system, fare free service is not a feasible idea. But systems where the fare box recovery ratio is low, yet the public is still willing to subsidize a large portion of the system and make service operate with subsidy, predominantly subsidy, and the system ridership is fairly low, and there isn't a ton of administration cost, this fare-free transit is actually a feasible idea and it makes some sense. And there's a there's a line. I mean, when when you're looking at 20% fare box recovery ratio, which means you're only coming you're only getting a fifth back. 15% fare box recovery ratio, which is I think about where Kansas City was, 10% fare box recovery ratio. I mean, if I were operating a system, my public through their taxes, property taxes, whatever, was paying 90% of the operating expenses already. And we had such slim ridership that I said, if we just make this free, we're going to gain a ton of riders. I mean, we're only, we're already subsidizing 90% of it. We might as well go all the way. The cost of collecting the fares is greater than what we're collecting at all. And that's the true point. I mean, once, once you reach that point, it's a no brainer, but you get pretty close to that point with 10%, 15%. Somewhere around there, it becomes an almost automatic to me personally. This is where you need to switch. Honestly, if you're running below 20, you really need to float this idea as far as fare box recovery ratio. And I think that's one of the golden metrics when it comes to this. Um, so are we seeing a trend? I don't know. It's, it's becoming more prevalent. There's lots of people that have some optimistic thoughts about this. And I tend to think that this is a very agency-specific thing, but I, I think there is a stigma behind fare-free transit that does need to go away. I don't like it when fare-free transit is brought up and it's just automatically shot down as unfeasible. Well, if we're already subsidizing 80% of the system, is that feasible? I mean, you might say, well, everything has a cost and nothing's for free. Well, you're already providing 80% of it for free. So if you're gonna say nothing's for free, then just take away all the subsidy and just say, screw you to the person that can't pay. But no, you're willing to subsidize it for what? For some goal. And that's why I keep going back to goals and means. So it's a discussion that needs to be had. I think just to brush it under the rug and say, no, it can't be done. Everything has a cost. You know, if we make it free, it'll just, it'll be horrible. Well, how do you know? I mean, have you run the models? Have you seen? The, the effect that it's had in these agencies like St. Lucie County where ridership tripled in the year afterward? If you were able to provide triple the mobility to your community, would you have a different thought? And so I think there is, it's optimistic that places are talking about it, but I don't think that it's a solve all. I don't think it's a, it's an all around solution and it doesn't work in all scenarios really just depends on the system. So there's a lot of data that needs to be considered when making the fare free move. So what do you guys think? I want everyone to comment down below. Comment your thoughts. What do you think about fare free transit? Would you want fare free transit in your city? With that, please subscribe to my channel and I will catch you guys on the next one. Peace.